If somebody asked you to name the most successful director of all time, you'd probably think of either Spielberg, Lucas, or James Cameron. But if we're simply talking about the number of theatre tickets sold, that title should go to the director of such classics as Casablanca, The Adventures of Robin Hood, and White Christmas, Michael Curtiz. Curtiz has had a complicated relationship with film critics. On the one hand, his influence is undeniable. His best films are as enduringly popular and influential as they were when they were first released, and in all probability, they'll still be popular a hundred years from now. On the other hand, his work has been dismissed by academics, particularly ones who adhere to the auteur theory. His ability to turn his hand to any genre, combined with a perceived lack of reoccurring ideological themes and creative preoccupations, as well as his situation firmly within the studio system, has given him the reputation of the ultimate journeyman director, a master craftsman of beautiful films, but not a true artist in the sense of Francois Truffaut or Ingmar Bergman. Here's how Andrew Saris described Casablanca in the American cinema. The director's one enduring masterpiece is, of course, Casablanca, the happiest of happy accidents, and the most decisive exception to the auteur theory. However, taking a larger view at Curtiz's 60-year career, we see a man whose natural instinct for story, acting, and images ferried him from his humble beginnings with some of the first films in turn-of-the-century Europe, through the early talkies and into the golden age of Hollywood. Someone who adopted new technologies with ease and used them to advance the storytelling capabilities of cinema, whose cinematic style developed alongside and sometimes informed the look and feel of Hollywood through the first half of the century. Curtiz's life began sometime in the late 1800s. As a teenager, he witnessed the birth of cinema with the very first Lumiere films as they were being shown in his native Hungary. And after graduating from the Royal Academy of Theatre and Art in Budapest, he turned his hand into producing the very first Hungarian films. Later, travelling around Europe, working throughout the small pockets of film industries that were emerging around the continent, honing his skills as a director, taking on larger and larger projects until he was eventually directing the largest European productions of the silent era, commanding thousands of extras, scores of assistants, makeup artists, cameramen and technicians, until his work grew so large that it caught the attention of Hollywood, in particular Warner Brothers Pictures, where he would spend the majority of his career creating some of the best films that Hollywood had ever produced. In 1926, at the age of 39, Curtiz moved to America and started working for Warner Brothers, which at the time was still a relatively small studio. Of his earliest American work, none is more engaging than the twin pictures of Dr. X and the mystery of the Wax Museum. These early horror films used two emerging film technologies that were revolutionary in the early 30s, sound and a beautiful looking two-strip Technicolor. Curtiz used these new technologies to create two of the most memorable pre-code horror films, complete with the kind of lurid ideas and themes that were only possible before the Breen era. Drug abuse, sex, cannibalism, and mass slaying. Like many of these early sound films, filmmakers hadn't yet fully integrated non-diegetic elements such as music and sound effects, which means that while these early sound films do have dialogue, they're largely carried on the strength of their visuals. Curtiz combined his strong, almost expressionistic style that he developed in the silent era with the new edition of dialogue, and the results are two of the best horror films of the early 30s. This combination of European art house techniques with a modern Hollywood style is something he would retain throughout his career. In 1933, Curtiz directed the prison escape film 20,000 Years in Sing Sing, and though a fairly simple plot, it's the first example of a reoccurring theme in Curtiz's work, that of the ability of criminals and the morally bankrupt to reform themselves and become better people. It's an idea that would reappear in classic films such as Front Page Woman, Angels with Dirty Faces, Casablanca, and Curtiz's final film, The Comancheros. In 1935, Curtiz would secure his first mega-hit with the swashbuckling adventure film, Captain Blood. 
Curtiz's masterful camera work, instinctive ability to tell a story, and ability to get the best out of his actors made him the perfect director to helm these big budget adventure films. And the success of Captain Blood led to a string of swashbuckling films not only for Curtiz and leading man Errol Flynn, but for the industry as a whole. The 1940s was arguably the most artistically fruitful decade for Curtiz, and it saw the release of some of the director's most personal films. The Sea Wolf in 1941 is a condemnation of the fascist ideology that was tearing through Europe at the time, and had destroyed the home and family of Curtis. And it's indicative of the kind of films that Curtis would produce at this point in his career. Fiercely pro-American propaganda pieces that placed both the victims of fascism and those willing to stand up against it at the center of his stories. The Sea Wolf is probably Curtis's second best film, but it pales in comparison to the crowning achievement of his career, Casablanca. It's in my opinion, the greatest outcome of the Hollywood studio system, epitomizing all that is the classic Hollywood style. Casablanca is the work of many hands, the fantastic writing of the Epstein brothers, the screen presence of Brogart and Bergman, the music and cinematography, but above all, it's the direction of Michael Curtiz that pulled these threads together and delivered one of the greatest films in cinema history. Although Casablanca was the peak of Curtiz's career, he was no means done creating masterpieces. That same year saw the classical piece of Americana that is Yankee Doodle Dandy, and in 1945, we'd see the psychosexual mother-daughter film noir, Mildred Pierce, John Crawford's comeback film, which took a magnifying glass to American notions of class and self-worth. In 1947, Curtiz moved away from Warner Brothers to start his own production company, and he kicked things off with The Unsuspected, a stylish film noir that harkened back to his expressionistic roots. Unfortunately, this move away from Warner Brothers was the start in a decline of productivity for the director, who on average produced two films a year throughout the 1950s. Although he was no longer as prolific as he once was, Curtis still managed to create some fantastic films, including The Breaking Point, White Christmas, and The Proud Rebel. Curtis passed away while directing his final film, The Comancheros, and while it's only a middling western, it still showed the sparks of creativity and talent of the man that gave us some of the greatest films in all of cinema. With a career spanning more than 60 years and over 170 titles in every conceivable genre, the debate still raises as to whether or not Curtis is an auteur, but what's very clear is that he is a genius. This is only a short introduction to the work of Michael Curtis, who directed a staggering number of films. But if you're interested in learning more, check out the Wrong Real podcast, where I talk about his career in depth. It's one of my favorite film podcasts, and I've learned so much from listening to a really diverse variety of film topics with really interesting guests. You'll find a link to that in the information box below. Thanks for watching. This is a bonus episode about the adventures of Robin Hood and the lovable rogue. You'll find it by clicking here. You can subscribe and click here to support me on Patreon and get access to even more bonus content.